rotaries uh, around town when I first got here. It's a series of slides that I uh, expound upon. Uh, it's a little bit about the center, a little bit about me, uh, and a little bit about the uh, services that we can offer that uh, give uh, patients uh, academic level care close to home. So uh, the Northern Illinois Cancer Treatment Center is a nonprofit radiation oncology center. Uh, it's located between Sterling and Dixon. It was established in 1988 uh, with a, as a joint ownership between CGH Medical Center and KSB and Dixon. That's our website there. Uh, we have plenty of information there. And I'm, uh, I was the new full-time radiation oncologist as of January of 2017. Uh, there was a series, there was a period of time when they had uh, locums physicians in, uh, but they, they uh, kind of recruited me out of the military uh, for my first civilian position. Uh, my background, uh, I grew up as an Air Force dependent. I was born in Germany, spent two years there, four, two in Turkey and four in Japan uh, before 10th grade. Uh, <coughs> I went to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh for, I got my BS in chemical and biomedical engineering. I graduated uh, there in 1986. I joined the Navy to fly uh, right after that, so I never actually used my uh, chemical engineering degree. Uh, I was a Naval flight officer. Uh, in a, a six intruders. Uh, I was a bombardier navigator uh, for several years. I got off active duty in uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1991, and uh, was an environmental engineer and a drilling reservist. Uh, I was actually uh, drilling at the, uh, the Pentagon in the Navy Command Center. I wasn't there uh, when, the, uh, when it was hit, but that, that was the site in the Pentagon where I was, uh, I was doing my one weekend, uh, or one weekend a month, two weeks a year. <coughs> I uh, returned to medical school in 1996, graduated in 2000 uh, with an MD from the Uniformed Services University in Bethesda. Uh, I did my internship there in internal medicine for a year. I wanted to go right into radiation oncology at that time, but the Navy uh, wasn't, was only taking uh, one applicant and I, I lost out the slot. So I started uh, my payback time for the, uh, they paid for medical school, so I started my payback time uh, as a flight surgeon. I uh, went to Pensacola for six months, got some flying, uh, re up my flying training, and then went to uh, Washington State where I was attached to a, a VAQ uh, EA-6B Prowler Squadron for several years. When that was all done, I started residency training at Duke in 2004, was there till 2008. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of Duke. There's a strong academic orientation there. Uh, I learned to, uh, that I like to write and publish there, and I've been doing a little bit of that uh, ever since. Uh, I haven't, I've still got a couple of projects I'm working on for my time in the, in the Navy. During that, that time, in my junior year, I did a fellowship at the uh, several month fellowship at the Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Hiroshima, Japan. There's a sister facility in Nagasaki. Uh, it's, it houses, it's a joint uh, a Japanese American project that houses all the records of uh, people that were exposed to radiation at the time of the atomic blast in both cities. And there's a long-term follow-up of people that were exposed, uh, not specifically malignancies, but they're looking at malignancies from the radiation exposure. Also long-term health effects of both the uh, the survivors, the next generation, and then the following generation. And it, where they're finding out that there really isn't any increased risk of malignancy in the, uh, the, the first generation nor the second generation, but there's some um, background effects where they're more prone to high blood pressure, cardiac disease, that they're still trying to tease out the causes to that. Uh, I was lucky enough to work on a couple papers there. Uh, I, I published a, uh, a paper on the uh, radiation, radio sensitivity of women that were pregnant at the time of the atomic bombing. Uh, there was some suggestive data, but it wasn't uh, statistically significant because there weren't enough uh, patients uh, in, in, the, uh, in the cohort at that time that were pregnant at the time of the bombings. But it's an interesting um, thought process because with radiation we use hormonal therapy sometimes, particularly with breast cancer, and there's thought to be a higher risk of pulmonary fibrosis in women that are uh, taking hormonal therapy, uh, sort of mimicking the, uh, the hormone shifts when they're pregnant. So I enjoyed that, that time there. When I was finished with my uh, training at Duke, I became an attending at uh, Naval Medical Center Portsmouth. I was there from 2008 to 2016. I retired after uh, 30 years in the Navy 
in 2016 and came to uh, the Sterling Dixon area. Uh, after graduation, I sat for my first, uh, my, my first and, and only uh, oral board certification in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where you, uh, you go from room to room and sit for a half hour with uh, subject matter experts whose papers you should have memorized and they ask you what those papers say. So it's, uh, I never want to go back to Louisville again. It makes me nauseous just to think about <laughs> flying through that city. Uh, and luckily, I don't have, I've only have to do that once. They, they, the maintenance of certification doesn't require you to go back and do it again. Um, so next slide. <coughs> this is the center. I don't know if anybody's been out there with a family member uh, or firsthand experience. The front desk up here, uh, big spacious uh, waiting area. Um, this is the um, exam room where the consultation room is. There's, I usually sit here in the rolly chair. Patient usually sits here and there's ample seating uh, for family members and friends uh, because a lot of the time uh, when patients are diagnosed with a malignancy, uh, I'm, I'm one of the first stops and they've still got that deer in headlights look. So they're not really absorbing all the information. So it's helpful to bring family members and luckily we have space to accommodate everybody so that uh, between the group of them, they'll get all the information. Although I, I, I try to spend as much time as I can. Usually I, 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 I can spend up to an hour, hour and a half with a patient with a new diagnosis and explain exactly what the steps of radiation therapy are. And that's the exam table and uh, the vitals machine in, our, uh, in the exam room there. The, this is the business end of, of what I do. Um, this is the, whoop, this is the uh, linear accelerator here. This is the head where electrons are accelerated and they are slammed into a tungsten target and uh, high energy electromagnetic radiation is, is pulled out here. This is the same thing from the other angle. This is the exam table that can move in three. Uh, it can move up and down, left and right, and, and back and forth uh, to adjust the patient into the, the proper field of view. And on this side, um, th these are imagers that do KV uh, images to let us know that we're looking at exactly what we want to look at. The difference is this is an MV or mega voltage uh, machine. These are diagnostic uh, films. This is the treatment head. So, and the patient, as the patient slides onto the table, they move this way. This linear accelerator um, can, can swing around and so can the patient. We use a technique called rapid arc, um, which is a, a form of delivering intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, you may have heard of, uh, but allows us to, to treat the patient while the gantry is spinning around the patient and the collimator leaves move in and out. So it allows me to paint the dose on where I want it and not where I don't want it. Uh, it's just a, a technique that's, that's, uh, that's in use at, at most facilities now, but we can, we can do pretty much uh, anything that an academic facility, more academic facility can do. <coughs> this is the CT suite. This is a recent uh, uh, addition, 2016. It's a wide bore machine. Wide bore means it's a little bit uh, wider in there. It allows me to position patients uh, if I want to, if I'm trying to treat just the axilla, I can position them arm akimbo and they can still go through the bore rather than have, having patients to just in a rigid position like this or arms overhead. So it allows me to, to get uh, important parts of the patient out of the way uh, and gives me uh, more opportunity to treat the tissue I wanna treat while avoiding uh, nearby critical structures. So since I've gotten to the center a uh, year and a half, uh, I brought this technique with me, deep inspiration breath hold. We'll talk about each of these uh, in a little bit. Uh, fiber optic loren uh, laryngoscope was not, a, was not something that was offered for follow-up for head and neck cancers. We have the scope now. I can, I can uh, scope patients. We've recently uh, been accredited for stereotactic body radio surgery, which is a way to deliver uh, radiation therapy over uh, a shorter course of, of time. Usual course for say lung and liver is uh, five to six weeks. With stereotactic body radio surgery, you can deliver that in a one to two, one to five actually fractions or daily doses of radiation uh, with the same uh, ability to, to uh, cure the cancer. Stereotactic radio surgery is essentially the same thing inside the skull. Uh, I think that I'm the only uh, uh, Optune certified uh, physician at least as far away as uh, Rockford and or uh, Quad Cities. Optune is a, is a portable wearable device used for patients with uh, glioblastoma, much like uh, Senator McCain uh, has. It's used after, it's actually a category one recommendation now in the NCCN guidelines, which means there, there's, there's no 
everybody agrees that it's something you should do. Uh, for glioblastoma, you take out as much of the tumor as you can. Uh, you give the patient radiation therapy with concurrent Temodar for six weeks, and you continue the Temodar for at least six more months. The Optune is a device that um, is wearable uh, electrodes on the scalp that attach to the, the bare scalp that alternates electric fields uh, through the patient's brain. Uh, and what that does is it disrupts microtubule formation for cells that are rapidly dividing. The side effect profile is minimal, and there is a statistically significant uh, increase in overall survival and median uh, disease-free survival. So I can, I can prescribe that for patients with, uh, in the area that are, uh, have uh, glioblastoma. So deep inspiration breath hold uh, is a technique used for left-sided breast cancer, where you can see that uh, if, I, if I need to treat the entire chest wall or the breast, if I use a radiation beam that's coming from this way, I need to shield the heart so this part of the breast and this part of the breast won't be treated. But if you have a, a woman take a deep inspiration, it lifts the chest wall out, pushes the heart backwards, and you're able to treat all of the breast that you need to treat without treating any direct beam on the heart, and it actually drops the scatter radiation dose to the heart as well. Uh, the, the DVH or the dose volume histogram for the heart and the lung are both improved. Uh, that allows us to maximize cure and minimize treatment side effects. Um, let's see. And the, the device itself, this is a representation of how the scan actually works. The device itself is a snorkel in the mouth that is tied to a uh, inspirometer such that when she takes a deep breath, there's a graphical representation on a pair of glasses. They say, take a deep breath up into the green and hold it. And the patient holds it while the treatment is happening. And then they say, exhale. Generally, women can do that in one, the, the chest wall can be treated in one deep inspiration for each of the beams, the lateral beam and the medial beam that make up the usual treatment course for uh, left-sided cancer. Let's see. <clears throat> the fibroc laryngoscope uh, I talked briefly about before. Uh, it's after I anesthetize the, uh, the nasal cavity, uh, the scope is passed through the nair uh, back into the nasopharynx. I can drop it down into the oropharynx and get a good look at the, uh, the larynx down here. That's the view that I see. Uh, that's the epiglottis right there. This is the anterior commissure or the front commissure. These are the arytenoids here. And you can see that's actually probably, that's the false vocal cord. That's the true vocal cord there. And when I ask patients to, I have, I have them say E and hold it, and E makes the cords go together, and I can snap a picture and save it for future reference. So it allows me to help the uh, ENT physician stage the, uh, the cancer properly and make sure that patients get the right treatment, and also helps in follow-up such that the ENT doc isn't the only one uh, with the ability to, to fi follow up on, on uh, these cases. 80% of head and neck cancer uh, cases that recur occur in the first two years. So alternating the uh, scoping duties between the ENT physician and myself uh, allows us to, for uh, better to pick up early detection and may allow us to perform curative salvage therapy if the radiation and chemotherapy uh, didn't work to fully eradicate the disease. Stereotactic body radio surgery I talked briefly about before. This is a CT scan. This is a patient cut this way. Uh, this is the aortic arch, this is the trachea, this is uh, vertebral body, spinal cord, uh, and this is a lesion in the, in the lung. If, a if there's a peripheral lesion away from the major blood vessels in the trachea, and uh, hopefully not right on the chest wall, instead of de treating it with daily radiation therapy with or without chemotherapy for six weeks, uh, you can treat it in as little as uh, three fractions of 20 gray. Usually, if it's a little bit closer to the... Uh, the mediastinum, you can treat it in five fractions. So it minimizes the patients, particularly in patients with uh, poor performance status who don't have the ability to come to the treatment center or wouldn't do well with coming to the treatment center every day for five or six weeks. We can do it in about five days. And there is good data to say that the cure rate is essentially the same. And this is usually for patients that can't tolerate surgery because if they could tolerate surgery, the surgeon could take this out and they'd probably be done with treatment. So it's particularly useful in patients that, that can't uh, be operated on because of their baseline pulmonary status. SRS is kind of the same idea, um, but inside the skull. This is the skull and the brain, and this is the high-dose region right around the single, uh, single isocenter uh, metastasis that the patient has. The usual course of treatment up until we could offer this 
from, from uh, one MET to 50 metastases was whole brain radiation therapy. Uh, the reason being is that if we focus all our radiation therapy on one particular area, the likelihood is that uh, there's more areas of cancer of the brain. We just can't see it on the MRI yet. So we treat the disease we can see and the disease we can't see. But now with this technique, uh, if there's one to three metastases, we can offer them treatment that focuses the radiation on those one little areas and with the, with the, uh, the possibility of offering to hold off or do later the whole brain radiation therapy, uh, which is good. Uh, unfortunately, there is with chemotherapy, there's a, 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 a phenomenon called chemo brain where the uh, brain doesn't function as well after it's been exposed to uh, toxins like chemotherapy. The same thing is true with treating the whole brain with radiation therapy. Uh, patients uh, go to the store for three things, come back with two, forget people's names at, at uh, parties, lose car keys a little bit more frequently. So if we can spare them the overall cognitive decline by treating just the area of disease, uh, we can prolong the time till, and they may not eventually need whole brain radiation therapy. But that is becoming the standard of care, uh, and that is something that we can offer, uh, wasn't offered at the, uh, at the cancer treatment center until we got here, and uh, John uh, and myself, our, our physicist, worked together to make sure that we, we could focus the radiation beam uh, repeatedly uh, and reproducibly right at that area of cancer, uh, because once it's in, I can't take it back. So we want to make sure it's exactly right on target uh, the first time. So this is our information again, uh, the Northern Illinois Cancer Treatment Center. There's our website again. Uh, you can call with any questions. Uh, I hope to not ever see any of you professionally, uh, but if uh, I do, or if a, if a family member uh, or yourself uh, is diagnosed with cancer, um, we're happy to see you, um, tell you everything that uh, we can offer. And uh, I strongly encourage second opinions at uh, academic centers, uh, but I tell patients that if the second opinion is the same as the first, I think I'd rather get my daily treatment for five or six weeks close to home rather than driving an hour one way each day. So, and I'm happy to work with uh, the, uh, the academic centers if their plans are a little bit different uh, than mine, but generally th the, the plan is exactly the same. Uh, I stay current with the, uh, the guidelines up to date, um, and now that we can offer these new techniques, there's really not much that they can offer that we can't. So with that, I think I'm done with slides. If anybody has any questions, I can uh, answer any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Could you go back to the one with the breath? Because my phone was ringing. I think someone just you know, threw up and I didn't get it. So in general, uh, what happens with, with breast cancer or, or, or well, with uh, an intact breast, with breast conservation, you do a smaller surgery uh, and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. With if you have a mastectomy and the nodes are positive, you generally need radiation therapy to the chest wall. So in order to do that for left-sided, uh, for right-sided, you can see that the heart will be away from the radiation field, but the left is predominantly, or the heart is predominantly a left-sided uh, organ. So if I can do something to to uh, move that heart out farther out of the field and the lung and chest wall forward, I can minimize the dose to uh, normal tissue critical structures, the heart and the lung. Uh, and the, the technique is, I, I think we've had one patient that, that for w whatever reason, claustrophobia or, or just general not, uh, she, she just could not do it. Uh, but that's one out of probably 50. So in general, it's, it's very easy to do. Um, and we'll use it if we, if we, if we can. Uh, but in that patient, um, we generally, I, I, I fell back on the, the techniques that we used before we got the deep inspiration breath hold. It was good treatment before, it's good treatment now we can just offer something better if the patient's body habitus and their ability to hold their breath is conducive to that. See anything else? Can I ask, I mean, what, what kinds of treatment goals does this study not seem to do? Um, <coughs> well, any cancer that, 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 part, that radiation fits in part of their, their treatment protocol uh, we can treat. Uh, in general, there's only a few malignancies, uh, solid malignancies that aren't that don't have radiation somewhere in the treatment path. Uh, a lot of times with early lung cancer, you don't need any adjuvant treatment, chemotherapy or radiation treatment. Um, but anything where radiation is indicated, generally we we can do it here. And I know you work closely with Dr. Alex. Absolutely. 
Yes, I worked with uh, surgeons, uh, radiation oncologists. If, the, if there's something like a, uh, a particularly a GYN oncology, uh, those, those uh, sometimes require treatments with iridium stepping sources, brachytherapy that we don't do here. And I, I've got a good working relationship with several. I can point, point people in the right, direc right direction. I can do the external beam to the pelvis and then hand the patient off to the, uh, the other provider for the brachytherapy and vice versa. We've, we've done that both ways. So the referral patterns are, are very good. If there's, any, if there's some reason I can't do something here, uh, which is very unlikely, uh, I've got people that I can refer to. Absolutely. I mean, because we're not co-located, it's, 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 it might as well be a one-stop shop, really. Uh, I, s I speak with Dr. Ali Khan several times a week. We meet at Tumor Board in this room every two weeks. We talk about all the, all the cancer cases. The surgeons are here. Uh, everybody's close. Um, he has my phone number. I have his. We text about patients all the time. Um, and and the, the only reason he's not located there and I'm not located here is just the footprint of his facility with the infusions. It operates differently than the daily treatments with radiation. Uh, and right now, it would be nice if they were together, but they're as close as, as, as co-located as you can be, just not in the same building. Anyone else? I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you very much. And if any questions come up, please uh, give us a call. We're always uh, happy to entertain uh, questions about uh, yourself, family members, uh, whatever you'd like to talk about. Thanks for having me.